Good morning. I am so glad to see uh, the number of you who are here today, here at um, Salem Shalom Lutheran Church here in Indianapolis, Indiana. I am Pastor James Capers, and I'm going to be your celebrant for today. Um, let us begin our service with a brief order for confession and forgiveness. For those of you who are in sanctuary, let us stand together as you are able. And we begin this service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the aid of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that attentive to your word, we may confess our sins, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As we continue in this worship service, we are reminded that um, uh, perhaps many times during the week we have said some things or done some things that are not pleasing to God. And so we take this moment uh, to confess our sins and receive his forgiveness. And so let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Let the church say amen. amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
suffering and rejection you bring forth our salvation and by the glory of the cross you transform our lives grant that for the sake of the gospel we may turn from the lure of evil take up your cross and follow your son Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord amen please be seated Good morning. Good morning. A reading from Isaiah. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let him confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reading responsively from Psalm 116. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. For the Lord has given ear to me whenever I call. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over the innocent. I was brought low, and God saved me. Turn again, turn again to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt well with you. For you have rescued my life from the grave, and my eyes ears, and my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. A reading from James. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, 
we guide the whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guarded by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and creature, it can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue of restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives? Or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we welcome the gospel. Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. Hallelujah. According to Mark, the eighth chapter, glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your minds not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and he said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes into the glory of the Father with the holy angels. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated.
Who do you say Jesus is? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, by the Spirit, you give us the authority and the, the power to be able to grab on to your matchless mercy. And we ask, O oh God, that you would give us that zeal so that we might represent your kingdom in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake only. Amen. You are well aware of the fact that we use, uh, for the readings of scripture, we use something that is called the Common Lectionary Series. And sometimes in this series, there are curves that are thrown uh, in our way. The Common Lectionary Series is a set of passages that are agreed upon by several denominations throughout the world, including Lutherans, including Presbyterians, including Methodists and Episcopalians and the Roman Church. These are just but a few that adopt these readings of scripture. I was explaining in Bible study one day that uh, this is done so that the worshiping believer is given a good dose of of scriptures so that uh, he or she, if they are in attendance of the worship service, will at least get about 50 to 60 percent of what is in the Bible. And it will also mean that they can't pick and choose what they want to hear, what they want to read. One could read the Bible so that one will not ever hear some of the troubling passages. They could actually be able to hear only the good things, the, the marvelous things, the things that make one feel good all of the time. But if one permits one to hear most of the Bible, one will inevitably come across those words of God that are a challenge. They make us uncomfortable. And that causes us to dig down deep into our lives and make us uneasy. One preacher once said that the preacher's responsibility is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And there is a Lutheran take on this. It is the difference between the law and the gospel. The law accuses, points out the wrongs, points out the inconsistencies, points out the problems that we have, points out the issues that are in our lives, points out the sins that separate us from God and from one another. But the gospel, the gospel tells us of forgiveness and acceptance. These have different roles and in uh, in order for the whole counsel of God to be heard and experienced, one must hear both. One must hear both law and gospel. One hears the accusation of the law, whose purpose it is to let us know, if we don't already know it, know it, that all fall short of the glory of God. And then one hears the gospel, which tells us that even though we do not and are not able to follow the complexity of the complete law of God, that in spite of that, and for Christ's sake, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world takes our sin upon himself and is able to bring forgiveness to the one who is willing to admit, yes, God, I'm a sinner, 
and I need God's forgiveness. When we, believe, when we believe what God has done through the work and the person of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, we are accepted, and, and we should not doubt that fact, says Luther. And we are thus able to walk in that forgiveness, knowing the loving God who is not so high that God is not able to come down near us in Jesus, the anointed one. And after that, repentance and forgiveness then becomes the process by which we live our lives. And so because of the fact that we are encouraged, almost made to hear the whole counsel of God, we run into these passages that cause us pause. And because we have been claimed by God in baptism and faith and belong to God in Christ Jesus, we are obliged to hear what he is saying to us. In the Gospel of Mark, we encounter in this shortest gospel of the four gospels, most succinct and early gospel in the New Testament, we hear Jesus doing many miracles. Jesus' ministry has taken on a powerful dimension. After he was baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan, and after undergoing the temptations and standing up to Satan himself, Jesus teaches about the word, which is a pre preview of how people will take what he is saying to them. He then performs miracles after miracle. Blind people see, lame walk, demons come out of folks. Sick people get healed. And all of these demonstrations of God's power are there for people to experience and hear. And even though he has called some disciples, he has not ask them of anything. He only is teaching them about the word. He is only showing them who he is by what he does. And then there comes this moment. The Bible says that Jesus is leaving Galilee and is on his way to the city of Caesarea Philippi. And while on the road, he asked the disciples a question. He asked them, who do people say that I am? Now, the important thing is to notice here that Jesus doesn't ask this question in the temple or in the synagogue. This question is not answered, if you please, in the church. For most of us, this kind of question is easier to answer in the walls of a building like this. This, after all, is a relatively safe place. It is a comfortable place for us. For us to speak of spiritual things in the Bible and in the worship of God is an easy task for us in a building like this. But Jesus is on his way to Caesarea Philippi, which is known as a place of a particular Greek and Roman god, Pan, the god of nature. That particular place could be identified as the place of Baal worship in the Old Testament. It is here where he asks the question, who do people say that I am? And brothers and sisters, it is in the world where we are asked the same question. It is really on Monday, Monday morning, when you and I have an opportunity to be asked, uh, who is Jesus? We are asked by our spouses. We are asked by our coworkers. We are asked uh, this by classmates. We are asked this question when we get into the internet. It is the deepest question that we will ever answer. Who do people say that Jesus is? Who is he in our lives? And what difference does this make in the way that we live? And what has he done for us? To say such things in the comfort of the Salem building is nice, but where will it really count? Well, when Jesus asked this question of his disciples, they begin to answer. And they answer with the prevailing gossip that has been going around. Some say John the Baptist, uh, they say. 
because there are some like Herod who are afraid that John the Baptist is raised from the dead. And some are afraid that Jesus will get done preaching and begin to meddle in their lives. Some say one of the prophets, because of the miracles that Jesus is performing, like Elijah, who was able to bring down fire from the heavens and, and who was able to heal a boy simply by laying across his body to give him life. But Jesus says to him, them, but who do you say that I am? This is a most important question. Who do you say that I am? Because ultimately, this is the question that each of us will answer at the end of time. I believe that God will ask each one of us, yes, I know that what your mother said, and I know what your father said. I know what the preacher said, but who do you say that Jesus is by your life and your word? And you know, as I said before, that there's always one in the group. <laughs> and you had them in your classroom, and you had them uh, in various places who wanted to answer very quickly. And we said that Peter is often that kind of person. Matthew tells us in uh, his gospel that he's not totally responsible for what he says, but the Father has revealed it to him in heaven. But it is Peter is the one who answers Jesus' question. And what does he say? He says, you are the Messiah. You are the anointed way, one of Yahweh. You are the Christ. And my friends, he is saying this in the world. Peter is saying this among all of the gods that are trying to get our attention. He's saying this among the gods in our lives, the gods of things. He is saying this among the gods of political personalities, the gods of sports in Indiana, the god of this country or culture, the gods of fame and fortune, the gods of importance to which we strive, the gods of addictions, the gods that are taking us for a ride. Peter says, you are what we have been waiting for, for a long time. You are the Christ, the very son of the living God. Now that was a brilliant word. It was truth. Truth that a Jew in Peter's position would face, that Jesus was and is the Messiah. But then the challenge comes later because they are not finished talking to one another. Notice that what Jesus says about those who desire to be disciples of him, this Jesus, the anointed one, the Christ of God. But in the New Revised Standard Version, it says, he called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, the problem with this translation, as I have seen, is that it does not respect the intimacy of what Jesus is getting at in Mark's gospel of the text. For it actually reads, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Or you can translate it, if anyone would come after me, she must deny herself and take up her cross and follow me. There's an intimacy to Jesus' words. It's not to a whole group of people. One of the things that I, that I learned um, in, a, um, in a course on management is when you make announcements, you never make them to a whole group of people. But you go to the individuals and you talk with them and you ask them that question. And then in that context, you may get the right answer. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and then follow him. 
during the season of Lent, we most often get involved in what's called self-denial. Now, we deny ourselves of certain foods. We deny ourselves of certain habits, perhaps. We, in an effort to reach self-improvement, we do some new things. That's called self-denial. It is taking pride and placing it in a box and burying it. It is having Jesus to sit on the throne of our lives. That is what real denial is. Jesus does not talk about self-denial, but he talks about denial of self. I once heard a saying on a bumper sticker, and it says, Jesus is my co-pilot. If we listen carefully to that passage, we might want to say, if Jesus is our, your co-pilot, you need to change sheets. You need to change seats. And then Jesus continues. Not only deny yourself, that is, Remove yourself from the throne. Place him on the throne. And then he says, you take up your cross. What is the cross? I think many times we think that the cross of those situations and problems that come in our lives, and it comes in the lives of everybody, whether they are Christian or not. The difficulties, the struggles, the, the, the hurts, the, all of those things come to everyone as a result of being in the world. But that's not the cross that Jesus speaks of. To take up the cross is for us to be willing to publicly display our faith and suffer the consequences that such a display might evoke. That's what the cross is. It is something that we intentionally do for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the gospel. And as a result of that, we get our desserts. So Jesus, first of all, says, if you are going to be a follower of mine, you must first of all deny yourself. And then he says, you must take up your cross. And finally, he says, and then follow me. Wherever he wants you to go, that's where you go. Whatever he wants you to give up, that you give up. Wherever he wants you to live your life, that's where you want to live your life. To whomever he wants to us to witness. He wants us to do that. To stand for those who can't stand for themselves. To represent those who can't represent themselves. And if you do that, you may get some, and we talked about it yesterday after Bible study, you may get some backlash. But that's what it means to follow Jesus Christ. So there's a song that I would like us to sing as a, as a way of responding to this word. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Try with me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. I'll go with him through the darkness. I'll go with him through the darkness. 
I'll go with him through the darkness. I'll go with him, with him all the way. I'll go with him through the valley. I'll go with him through the valley. I'll go with him through the valley. I'll go with him, with him all the way. So where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him all the way. Amen. Let us stand together. And let's confess the faith of the church in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Having been made children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Revealing God, you have made yourself known through bread and wine, water and word. Continue to nurture your church, that it is a place where your presence is experienced and shared. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Creating God, you brought life into being and call it good. Bring new creation to lands devastated by tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, and other disasters, especially after Ida. Restore forests and curb overflowing waters. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Protecting God, you desire all people to live in peace and safety. Provide for all who are in danger. Strengthen first responders to help meet the complex needs of others. Provide care and compassion as they face trauma on themselves. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Transforming God, you announce release to the captives and freedom to the oppressed. Break chains of discrimination and injustice. Amplify voices that go unheard and inspire us to advocate for those who are overlooked. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Forming God, you gather this community together. Ship our communal life that in our prayer, praise, and worship, we honor you and encourage one another. Keep our disagreements civil and increase our joy in working together. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Redeeming God, you accompany your people through every stage of life. We give, thanks, we give you thanks for the sins who now rest in your embrace, especially those who we name before you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Those who worship in the sanctuary have given to the Lord as you entered. So let us pray. Generous God of abundance, all good gifts come from your gracious hand. We offer you this bread, fruit of the vine, and money, the harvest of our time and labor. Make us wise stewards of all your gifts, that your name may be exalted in all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. And let us now prepare for communion. Would you please um, gather your elements? Your bread and cup. Let us pray. Holy God, mighty Father, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In a night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, his resurrection and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the will of all who share this one heavenly food, the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Now together, let's pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. take the bread let us eat together this is the body of Christ given for you mm -hmm. 
Let us now take the cup. Let us drink together. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ which you have received strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. pray. We give you thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy, you will strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. Um, uh, we continue to worship in this fashion every single Sunday uh, here uh, on campus at 1030. Those of you who are not ready to come inside a building per se, you can still come to the parking lot and tune in to FM 87.9. Um, we also uh, continue to have our Bible study. We are in the book of Isaiah. We are now in chapter 11, I think it is, and uh, we are just having a good time and actually you know, this Lutheran take of law and gospel, it comes throughout the book of Isaiah. Periodically, we get the law, and then we also hear the gospel uh, in that text as well. So you are invited to please come and to uh, fellowship with us. If you'd like to be part of the Bible study, um, just simply um, contact us, and we will send you the link. And it is a Zoom Bible study, so we'll send you the link, and you'll be able to connect. Um, those of us who uh, are on the leadership team, uh, our church council, we are having our meeting this afternoon at uh, 1230. Uh, you should have the link uh, today if you haven't received it already. And then we will look at uh, what God is doing and, what, and how we can catch up to what it is that the Lord uh, wants us to do as we continue to move forward. Uh, please uh, be in prayer for my wife, um, Veronique, uh, she just had a uh, operation on this past uh, Friday, and um, and so she's uh, at home uh, recuperating. And um, we I ask you to just to continue to be in prayer for her as she continues to. She had a, an operation on her cuff, and so um, it's a little painful, as one might think, but um, but she is actually making some progress. So we're happy for that. Well. Please let us rise together and, um, and let us receive uh, the benediction. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.
peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.